Hi, everybody. Um, this is Pete Anderson. I'm happy to be here with you. I um, want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, and uh, thanks for joining me for this uh, talk on prep benchmarks uh, in pregnancy. My disclosures. This is the outline I'll follow. Um, first, I will describe the need uh, for PrEP in pregnant women, uh, then discuss the things we're interested in, the physiological and pharmacologic changes that occur during pregnancy, and then how that will affect uh, the PrEP benchmarks that we use for adherence uh, testing, um, specifically for pregnant women. So first, there is a, a big need for PrEP, using PrEP in pregnant women. Uh, however, there's very little guidance on how to do so because of uh, very little research uh, in this population. As this audience knows, uh, that's a common issue in pregnant women. Um, this is a, just eight uh, publications asking for either more research or uh, some guidance on how to use PrEP. Uh, in pregnant women. And one of the big issues is the, the lack of uh, good solid PK data, including um, PK uh, as it relates to adherence uh, monitoring, which is the topic uh, for today. So today we'll talk about the benchmarks that we use for uh, assessing PrEP adherence. Um, these are um, on the left in the table, uh, sinofibir diphosphate in red blood cells uh, measured with, with blood spots. Uh, and the adherence interpretations are um, an average dosing in the preceding week uh, based on the drug concentration. Um, and as you can see, for example, uh, a blood spot level of 700 uh, is associated with four or more doses per week on average. Uh, these are from uh, non-pregnant adults in the U.S. These were generated from uh, those that population. Uh, in the middle is uh, the interpretations for plasma tenofovir. Um, as you can see, for example, um, a concentration of 35.5 nanogram per mil is associated with a uh, dose in the preceding uh, 24 hours. So the interpretation is different. Uh, plasma tenofovir because of the short half-life tells you about uh, how long ago the most recent dose uh, was. And then finally, uh, an emerging uh, adherence test is tenofovir uh, in urine using a point of care uh, lateral flow immunoassay. Um, and the cutoff for this assay is uh, 1,500 nanogram per milliliter. Uh, and uh, this informs whether a person has taken uh, PrEP. Uh, and this whole slide is based on uh, tenofovir disaproxyl uh, within the last uh, five days. So the question is, these benchmarks, do the, would they apply? How do we apply them to uh, pregnant women? So as this audience knows, uh, pregnancy is associated with uh, several physiological changes that will affect the pharmacokinetics of our PrEP medications. Uh, the big ones for, for PrEP are a plasma volume increase that actually results in a lower albumin and hematocrit. That's going to affect the blood spot concentrations for tenofovir diphosphate. Uh, in addition, there's um, GFR increases that occur during preg pregnancy. Uh, and hepatic clearance uh, changes, typically leading to increased clearances for renally and hepatically eliminated uh, drugs. I did want to point out that a lot of these physiological changes maximize uh, around the second trimester and then uh, may actually um, begin returning to normal uh, in the third trimester. And um, I'll point out in one of the studies that I think we see that uh, in the data, this, this sort of correction or returning towards normal uh, in the third trimester for pharmacokinetics. We'll start with plasma uh, tenofovir and the effect of pregnancy 
on plasma area under the curve for tenofovir. And there's been now um, a number of studies that have shown that plasma tenofovir concentrations are decreased on the order of 20 to 58 percent, uh, depending on the design of the study. But the AUC studies um, for tenofovir uh, seem to settle around 20 to 30 percent in terms of reductions in, in tenofovir AUC during pregnancy, and that's the second and third trimesters. Uh, fewer data with uh, and, and limited uh, and uh, not uh, controlled setting uh, data for uh, intracellular tenofovir diphosphate dry blood spots. Uh, a couple of references uh, shown uh, below the second bullet uh, and, and suggestive of about a 29 to 45% reduction uh, in tenofovir diphosphate in blood spots. Uh, however, those were, again, limited data, and, and recently a, a formalized pharmacokinetic study for uh, intracellular tenofovir diphosphate and blood spots in pregnancy was conducted, and this was the IMPACT 2009 study. Uh, it recruited uh, 40 adolescent girls and young women uh, between the ages of 16 and 24, uh, half in a pregnant group, so 20 pregnant half postpartum, 20 postpartum uh, from four African countries. Uh, these women uh, were assigned directly observed daily uh, tenofovir FTC uh, and uh, were sampled weekly. This is TDF, incidentally. And um, the characteristics of the two groups shown in the table below um, would point out that in the pregnant group, uh, the gestational age when they started uh, dosing was 18 weeks. Uh, so they were already in the second trimester when they started uh, dosing. So they dosed 12 weeks. So from the second trimester into the third trimester and blood sampling was weekly. These are the observed uh, results uh, on the left, the concentration time profile, time in weeks, uh, tenofovir diphosphate fentanyl punch concentration in the pregnant women, on the right in the postpartum women. Dashed line represents the median from the uh, adult studies, non-pregnant adults in the U.S. Um, a couple uh, features of, this, of these findings. One, concentrations were 31 to 37 percent lower in the pregnant women, 31 in the raw, the raw week 12 concentrations, 37% for modeled curves. Um, second interesting finding was you can see in the pregnant women uh, plot that uh, concentrations uh, seem to fall from weeks six to nine. Uh, and this is as uh, women went from the second into the third trimester, and then they sort of rise again in the third trimester. And I think we can uh, point to physiological uh, corrections in the hemodilution um, during that time to explain uh, that finding. So based on this directly observed formal PK study, uh, we can come up now with specific uh, benchmarks for uh, pregnant women and postpartum women in uh, African settings. And these are young adolescent and young women. Um, the, uh, constant, the benchmarks you can see in the pregnant group on the left, uh, and this shows the benchmarks um, determined by the 25th percentile of the raw data, and then a rock curve uh, to pick the best uh, cutoff um, but those cutoffs, as you can see in the pregnant group, are uh, significantly lower than they are in the postpartum uh, group. And the postpartum group is a little bit lower uh, than in the um, adults from the U.S. in the slide shown earlier. So we do have specific um, tenofovir benchmarks now in pregnancy in African settings. Uh, what about CAB in pregnancy? Uh, as this audience knows, CAB uh, 
was recently found to be highly effective in both men who have sex with men as well as women. And that was the HBTN 083 and 084 studies that have uh, just been uh, completed. Uh, there, however, is only inconclusive and limited uh, data for CAB in pregnancy, uh, limited, limited to uh, N equals three uh, pregnant women who, um, when found to be pregnant, stopped CAB, and then the PK was uh, followed in the tail phase. And I really don't think anything conclusive can be uh, drawn from those three uh, participants. Um, however, HPTN 084, the open label extension, which is um, if it hasn't started, it's it's going to start soon, will follow, will allow women to stay on CAB if they become pregnant and will follow PK. I think given though that um, dalutegravir and CAB are very similar structural analogs that we can um, uh, estimate what might happen to CAB during pregnancy. And that's based on the um, I think uh, solid data that we have for dalutegravir in that there's a 20 to 50% decrease in concentrations in the second and third trimesters. And, and I think um, although we don't know how much of that is bioavailability versus hepatic clearance, I think we can assume that uh, um, much of that is hepatic clearance and therefore CAB will likely have uh, similar reductions uh, as dalutegravir, uh, perhaps around 30%. While we don't have benchmarks uh, for CAB, uh, for PrEP, uh, we do know some, some the thresholds for um, our proposed thresholds for efficacy. These thresholds here have not been uh, validated clinically yet, but um, it, high concentrations uh, for CAB are in the eight times the protein-adjusted IC90 uh, concentration given in, in the table. Um, Somewhere in the middle would be between four and eight um, PAIC90 uh, shown here. And then low concentrations would be uh, below uh, the four times the IC90. So we may see pregnant women uh, falling into the lower concentrations if, um, if they do indeed have a 30% reduction. Um, uh, but data uh, need to be generated uh, for, for CAB. Um, the physiological changes uh, in pregnancy lead to lower uh, tenofovir benchmarks. Uh, this, I think, these findings uh, were predictable based on uh, physiological changes that uh, ma are, occur maximally at uh, between the second and third trimester, but then start to correct in the third trimester. Um, these specific changes are a 31 to 37 percent lower to no fear diphosphate and DBS. Now we have tables to give specific benchmarks for women, uh, 25 percent lower uh, to no fear and plasma. Um, and while urine hasn't been studied in pregnant women, I think we can predict that we will probably have a faster time to undetectable tenofovir in urine. So instead of five days, normally it may be three to four days in pregnant women. Um, I think for CAB, as CAB emerges, we uh, can expect that concentrations are going to be lower during pregnancy. Um, if it's like dalutegravir, it may be in the 20 to 30% range. Um, I didn't mention uh, TAF. Um, it is not approved in women in general yet for PrEP, uh, but studies are underway both in women as well as in pregnant uh, women. And those studies are listed here on this slide, which is a summary of uh, data that are forthcoming uh, for uh, PK of PrEP, uh, including um, data forthcoming for CAB, TDF, uh, TAF, a uh, depivirine ring in pregnancy, um, and even Islatrovir and Lenacaprovir. Uh, uh, Merck and Gilead in the last two bullets are including, will continue to follow women uh, who become pregnant uh, if they consent 
um, to get PK data for his Latrobeer and Latacaprobeer. Well, that's all. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoy the conference.